This conversation with Rajiv Malhotra is about his latest book, The Battle for Sanskrit. And I'm going to start by asking Rajiv to summarize for us what this book is about and why it has created so much furor. Okay, so uh, this book is a study of Western Indologists, particularly American Indologists. And by that term, I mean the people who study academically, they study Sanskrit, Sanskrit texts, ancient Indian history, Indian civilization. The general term Indology was adopted by the British and Europeans, and now Americans call it South Asian studies sometimes, but it is a very similar area. So this book critiques some of the most prominent, in fact, one most prominent person in that field, and his whole entourage, namely, namely Sheldon Pollock, who is at Columbia University, and his whole coterie, his whole entourage, and the influences he has, the kinds of uh, prejudices or biases, in my opinion, that lie in this, and what are some of the consequences. So I give a half the book is his work and where the prejudices are, and the other half of the book are, is about systemic issues, what are some of the systemic issues, and what are the consequences, and some recommendations. So tell me, what are, if you again could summarize, what are Sheldon Pollock's uh, key prejudices so, or distortions? So the, the title, the by byline of the book gives three big categories. It says, is Sanskrit political or sacred? Uh, is it oppressive or liberating? Is it dead or alive? Now each of these three is a pair of choices where mm -hmm. one choice tells you what is his position and the other choice is my rebuttal. So he considers Sanskrit and its text to be primarily motivated by political designs. All uh, of Sanskrit uh, texts? He says that, uh, yes, he, he says that the important ones that create history, mm -hmm. history is created when these uh, kavya and things like that are used by kings to spread their in influence. And uh, so this is Ramayana, Mahabharat, Vedas, Dharma Shastras. So when you include those, you included pretty much most of the... What Kalidas. about, say, Kalidas? Kalidas also, he would say, is a product of the same desire to spread the beauty of the language as a way of spreading power. So he has a whole theory on the politicization of, uh, the aestheticization of the political. So the aesthetics of Sanskrit and Sanskriti the la and the literature are a device for spreading uh, the king's power but using language and literature as a vehicle for doing that. And does he imply that only Sanskrit has done that or is he saying this is uh, typical the world over of different languages? So he has picked Sanskrit as his target and he says that for a thousand years Sanskrit spread because it was the most it was the best language for doing this. It had some built-in structures and built-in grammatical structures of hierarchy and so on. And he's referring to caste system. He's referring to that Sanskrit is so much built on Vedas and Vedas, according to him, are so much built on caste, hierarchy, and women. On the they, contrary, I, I yes. thought Vedas don't have caste hierarchies in well, the way that he... No, but he, he says that the, the women and uh, lower caste were not allowed to read these. Vedas and the Sanskrit uh, was not taught to these people. So the very origin is intertwined. But that's not factually correct. That is not factually correct. So I mean, it may have happened for a certain period in history. That is correct. But I don't think it can be said for all of the thousands of years that, is that Sanskrit because it's uh, too has been. A criticism of history. Yeah. And, and does he provide any evidence? He, he takes selective things. Uh, what, where he can pick and choose this item, that item, this quote to serve his purpose. He's very, very brilliant and very rigorous in doing that. No, but if you are selective, yes. you can't be rigorous. Well, he's rigorous in the sense. I mean, then you're a pamphleteer. No. You're not a scholar. Yeah. So he's not giving any exhaustive examples. He's not saying that there aren't counter examples, but he's loaded with dozens of examples which serve his purpose. And those he cites and quotes and uh, you know footnotes very carefully. So, so the case. other point is about. Sacred. It, so, it uh, caste oppression and gender oppression being right. endemic to Sanskrit. That is, is that correct. his case? That is correct. The Sanskrit is inseparable, has been inseparable from these things. Sanskrit, uh, they are Buddhists then took over Sanskrit and, and tried to liberate it because Buddhists brought a reform according to him. And then there's, uh, these uh, Brahmins, the Vedic Brahmins, decided to create Kavya and uh, starting with Ramayana. So according to Ramayana is after Buddha, which nobody accepts, but this is what they are saying. So this Ramayana was constructed as a device to popularize the same themes and the same hierarchy 
but now in, the, in a way that everybody could participate in. So in a sense it took what was uh, originally a secret device among the Brahmins, the Vedas, and now making it acceptable to the whole public, but it has all the hierarchy and oppression built into it. That's a, so basically. Yeah, but is he talking as a historian? Because this entire uh, period of history covering thousands of years, uh, to the best of my knowledge, Pollock isn't quite a historian. Well, but he would say he is. I mean, he, he, he would say, first of all, he wouldn't say it's thousands of years because he says history begins with writing, which is a problem I have because that means you've eliminated the whole oral tradition. And when history begins with writing, he says then writing started only in 200 BCE, so he's cut off thousands of years prior to that. Mm -hmm. And so for him, it, the period of history that, is, uh, that he wants to deal with is much recent. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and the, the superimposition of political lens includes removing the sacred. So that's another very important part. That's why the first question is, is, is it political or sacred? Because I would say a large reason for Sanskrit's success and for Sanskrit's spreading is because it brought some meaning to people's lives. He would say that it, had a, it was an elitist project of the kings. So his is a political method, political motive that he's looking for in the reason for writing all the kavya and spreading all the kavya. And mine is that people were chanting mantras, they were doing yagnas, they were doing jyotish, they were doing architecture, dance. It brought meaning to people's lives. It, it had, there must have been some grassroots value it brought. So the issue is whether it's top down, which is what he would say, or is it grassroots acceptance of Sanskrit. And considering that so much of literature in Sanskrit has been composed outside the courts. Right. It was not all Darbari right. literature. And he says that he, that is another interesting point. He likes to show, show that it was basically sponsored by kings. So one of my rebuttals is to show that it, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, poetry and, uh, were written outside the kings. Now, uh, this business of Sanskrit being endemically exploitative right. because the ruling class used it, would he say the same about English language? Well, he's silent on it, so that's one of my rebut rebuttals. Hmm. That now we have because that we have has the, definitely yes, and that's much been more used globally. Yeah, we have to study yeah. it. In, uh, and, uh, and the whole business of English language, English literature, and the aesthetics of English, and how it portrays a certain culture, and the sense of you know what is considered aesthetically nice, is all Westernized. So um, that's my rebuttal. In fact, that's what I discussed at the TIS talk in Bombay and they couldn't handle it. I talked about how the Indian ruling elite mm. as the aestheticization of English language, literature mm -hmm. and so on and all of us are part of it mm -hmm. and they just couldn't handle that because I'm taking their logic and turning it back on them. And the third point you said is about is Sanskrit dead or alive? Yes. Now so, wh why is he so desperate? prove or state that it's dead language. Because once it's dead, then it means that it's people like him who are scholars who can get to study it. If it's alive and the sans spoken Sanskrit language uh, movement is doing well, the Sanskrit Bharati movement, it's bad for him because politically he cannot control it. A dead language can be controlled. It's fixed. A oral, oral language, living language, spreading language. There are a lot of people with Adhikar to talk about it. But you know, when you see, he's trained as a Greek classicist and a Latin and Greek classicist. Mm. So those are dead languages. And so they're studied in a way that the expert who's a linguist, he's looking at something in a museum. It's not lived in people's lives. So this is the same stature, this is the sense of revival that he has in mind. He's very, he would say that the reason, uh, well his argument for saying it is dead is based on uh, looking at evidence and saying that it died. And, mm. and the reason it died is because Hindu kings killed it in the 12th century. Muslims in fact tried to save it. Is what he would I know that seemed the most ridiculous of all. When I read your book, I found that the hardest to stomach. Yeah, and he that Muslims tried to save it. Yeah, and he's given one, one from random examples where king was bad person, and maybe you know there are hundreds of kings, thousands of kings. You cannot take a few examples and do that. It would have to be a much more exhaustive research. And what troubled me is, you know, sort of exonerating the Mughals put Persian as a language, the British who put English as a language. Of the court and the, the court darbar and, and the medium of instruction. Yeah. And in fact he goes on saying multiple times that accusing or blaming the Muslims for having a, a marginalized Sanskrit is totally wrong. 
he very clearly says that that is wrong. So that is out. So he's very protective of Islam. Uh, and, and very protective of British colonialism. Yes, yes. British colonialism, okay, they did it, but you know, it was already dead. It was already dead before that. So this idea... Not really. In some parts of India, South India in particular, Yes. I don't think Sanskrit died no, Sanskrit, the way it did in, in there is North. A, actually, the Sanskrit Commission has produced a big bibliography of uh, hundreds of texts produced in Sanskrit, many Shastras, many Kavyas, all through the last thousand years. So Sanskrit in different places has always been alive. Plus Sanskrit is alive in the form of the, its use for worship. So it's not only as a Absolutely. common language. It's used in yagna, it's used in puja, it's used in meditation. You get a med your mantra. Uh, and, and the way it lives through the vernaculars. Because vernaculars could be seen as a popular form or, or an adaptation derived, largely derived out of Sanskrit. So Sanskrit lives in many ways. And that is my rebuttal to this. But you point. know what surprised me is his disdain of all Indian attempts to revive it, to right. give new life to it. Right. It's as though he feels it's an insult. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, they are setting up uh, Sanskrit departments in uh, American universities right. and setting up all these translation projects. Yes. So what does it mean? So it Is he implying control. that only Americans should have the right no, no. to do it? He, he wants, he, the center of this project of revival Sanskrit has to be under his adhikar and you know, people like him. And then they will outsource work Hmm. Sometimes, sometimes Kuli work. Like the clay series. Yeah, the, the Kuli work to Indians. Hmm. But ultimately, the editor-in-chief decides who gets to translate on what basis, what standard they get to translate. So it's, he's, not, he's, he's actually very much interested in training Indians to be like, thinking like him. And he's managed to train a few very important people. That Too he's many, like. some at my own center. Yes. Oh, he's a great favorite there. Yeah. That's true. Now tell me. All the difficulties that you faced in publishing this particular book, because we were in touch uh, on phone, right. you sitting in America fretting over all the difficulties you right. were having with your publisher, who was being forced to withdraw this manuscript and junk it. Uh, who was creating all the trouble? So, what were the obstructions and so, what were their reasons? So the thing starts, the problem starts in the Bangkok Sanskrit Congress. Uh, in 2015, June, uh, I was invited to be a keynote speaker and I spoke on this book. It was a huge success among the Indians and the Southeast Asian people. They loved it and they said, this is a book you all want to read. The Thai royal uh, princess, who's the uh, head of that uh, committee, the, the one that organizes all this, the head patron, I should say, sent a message saying she really enjoyed this and would love to get lots of copies of this book. Uh, so the, I would say the Asian side, the people who, were, who consider it their tradition that are called the insiders, they loved it at that event. The Westerners who were present, they were not happy at all and started tweeting and started sending messages, who is this guy, he is not qualified, he doesn't have the authority, um, and what does he, what, and, you know, sort of taking shots at me. And then this turned into more and more personal stuff. And then one uh, evangelist based in Princeton t turned it into a personal attack that uh, I lacked integrity and I didn't know how to write properly, I didn't know how to cite quotations properly, my previous books were flawed in this particular respect. So then they started this petition and they got 250 uh, signatures, but important people signed it. And we signed, had a counter petition that you put up and we got 11,000. So right. we had 40 signatures for every one of them. I mean, they should have just understood the message that the mm. public has spoken and keep their mouth shut. But then they turned it into media. Mm. And there was an article in Hindu, the article in Business Standard, None of them probably read any of the books. Against you. Against me. Without and, talking to you? Without talking to me. And I wrote to them saying I would like to uh, write to respond and never heard back. Someone introduced me to Ravi, who is Enram's brother. Mm. And he was a very decent man. We spoke on the phone. And I gave him a lot of uh, my evidence. And he, didn't, he hadn't thought of it. And he, hadn't, uh, he says that he didn't know about it. So I said, wouldn't the reader be better informed if you gave him my side of the story? Mm. So he said, why don't you write me all this? And I will pass it on to... Malini, who is the new editor-in-chief, and he recommended, would recommend that it, I should be given a chance to respond. Malini didn't have anything, want anything to do with it, me allowing, allowing me to have a response. In fact, when I pushed they, them at, They completely blanked it out? Blanked it out, and uh, nothing... So, right to, I mean... No right it's, to um, It's critique behind your back. Yes. In absentia. Correct. They're not willing to, to give you space to... 
Yeah. In, fa in fact, after lobbying enough times, that why am I not being given the right? And it is, it should be fair play. I should be given a right. You should give me the space. They never even wrote to me saying we're rejecting. They wrote an op-ed, they wrote an article in their newspaper saying the editor has the discretion, has exercised her discretion to deny Rajiv Malhotra named me, named me, to deny Rajiv Malhotra his claim to uh, give his point of view. That's Very, bizarre. You could is. have gone to press council. But I don't know how these things work. No, no, really. This is unprecedented. This is, so I really think you, sh you should, now. because I mean, she is, is, she did that to me as well. Yeah. And, and she told me to my face at one time, all these uh, protectors of Indian uh, tolerance right. and tradition, she told me to my face, she will never let me get published, yeah. because I wrote something that uh, bugged her and right. it annoyed her They're friends so in the CPA. Petty, so petty, so immature, and, and once they have, there's something you said that uh, they don't like, then for life you are blacklisted. I mean, this is, this is one of the top two newspapers in the country. It's a disgrace that we call this free speech. I mean, free speech is at the discretion of the editors and gatekeepers, and they tend to be people who are not very fond of me. So anyway, so this went on. And then when all this died down, the publisher was very nervous because they also were doing a lot of lobbying to the publisher, asking that they should not publish my books. I'm a bad fellow, and all kinds of problems with me. And so I, uh, I just stayed quiet for a few months, let this thing quieten down. And then the publisher and I started working again to you know, get this uh, going. And the publisher wanted me to take a lot of precautions to make sure I'm not saying anything that would be personal. We are very sure that we've had, they've had many lawyers look at it, many different people look. This book has been checked out more than probably any other book I know of by lawyers here in India, by people, legal people overseas. Uh, I see. By, by, by the publisher to make sure that, you know, I'm not doing anything defamatory and I'm not. I'm very courteous and I'm just disagreeing with their po positions. And so uh, then the, finally the thing went to press. After many, many rounds of uh, let's remove this or let's, let's water down this, let's not be too strong on that. And I'm very happy to be more and more courteous. In fact, I sent this to at least 10 people of my own to ask them, do you think there's anything rude or incorrect or something out, out of line and I would give the benefit of doubt to anybody who said well you know this one you really don't need to say it you've said enough of it so I, I watered it down in, in order to be courteous not removing the actual substance of my argument but just the tone however even after all of this when the book went to press it started printing copies were printing hmm. then I get a call when my wife and I are in a holiday in Florida after a few years we finally thought maybe I should have a break. Within a two three nights I got a call from Delhi that the printing has been stopped because some issues have been raised again. Some last minute more issues. Hmm. And this is ridiculous. You can get some lawyer to write some letter saying has he not, not pinpointing any, any particular paragraph or sentence but just raising rhetorical issues. Um, has he checked with Sheldon Pollock to make sure he will not be objecting? Oh. Has, he, has he received his permission to criticize him? Now I said, oh my what God. a ridiculous thing to say. No <laughs> one could be criticized. Did they take your permission when they exactly. banged at you yeah. at various forums? So you could never criticize a person if the mm. rules were that you need their permission. Mm. So this is so ridiculous. I said, well, if they don't agree with my criticism, they can write their rebuttal. That should be how it is. But the, the uh, fear, uh, you know, uh, the fear was that, okay, maybe they'll create another ruckus, uh, like the one they did in the summer, and do we really want to be in a, you know, mudslinging battle? And so I made some further changes, and I made uh, some young people in Princeton, uh, two of them, work 14 hours nonstop because my eyes are not that good, looking through all kind of little details and checking it here, checking there, producing lists and all that. So then it went back to press. Hmm. So this is the period I was very upset about because I had set up 23 appointments for events. And, and you know. To do with the release of the book. To do the release and distinguish people and lots of forums and uh, you know, I have volunteers. They put in so much time and, time and energy. I have in Bangalore, Chennai, Ahmedabad, Mumbai and Delhi, five teams. And they're doing it as a passion and for them to uh, raise the money, book halls, pay for the halls, get video cameras, you know, all of that that they were doing. I mean, it wasn't a fun thing for me to go and say to them that maybe the book won't happen or maybe it'll be delayed for a long time. So I was in panic mode. 
because I felt, you know, in case the book is cancelled for now and then has to be brought back, you know, it will, it will be very damaging for me. Mm. So I decided that uh, in parallel I should look for alternatives just to, just as a backup. If they, if everything is back on track, nothing like it. But if it's not back on track, I, I should have some alternatives because I cannot destroy my life as a, as a writer. And so luckily things were okay. Uh, we got the book, we got thousands of copies and the book has done extremely well. The publisher is very happy. Uh, we sold, sold out the first print run and much of the second print run. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's Had they responded at all? Nobody, uh, I wrote to Sheldon Pollock several times hmm. uh, saying should, let's have a debate. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, he, first he wasn't interested, then he said maybe we could have a, because I wanted a video debate online visiting like this and having conversations very relaxed, very friendly, saying you've written this, here's my view, what do you think? So it would actually raise the standard of thinking mm. of discourse rather than anger, rather than personal or emotional outbursts. So he, when I talked to him verbally, he was happy about this idea. He said, yeah, we should talk, maybe one day we will. But he wasn't pinned down easily. So when I wrote to him about this, he said he's not, he's not sure, let him think. And then after a couple of times, he said, maybe we can do it in writing rather than video. He was a bit nervous about uh, live, you know. Uh, but he said, maybe a neutral moderator can send questions to both of us and we can respond to the questions and also respond to each other. And then this part, neutral moderator can write up an uh, interview with both of us rather than video, it will be written. I accepted that. And then uh, close to the date of availability of my book, I wrote again saying that let's proceed with this written thing. And he didn't come back with any response. He just said, mm. wish you a happy holiday and we we'll talk oh. later. And so, so they chicken out they chicken when out. it comes to an open they, debate. Yes, they chicken. In, I, I would say let's take him at face value. Uh, let's then give him the benefit of doubt. I would say he's very busy, is what he said. He's very busy right now, and we'll th think about it later. Okay. Now, one of the key arguments you've used in this book is that Pollock, as an outsider, who does not really believe in all these sacred texts or doesn't even see them as sacred, as right. you mentioned earlier, that he sees them through a political lens and that too a Marxist, yes. um, class struggle, right. gender war uh, oppression, lens. Who's oppression, oppression, whom, all that stuff. who's oppression, that's right. Uh, no, normally, this is not how literary criticism is done. Mm. Um, I, I, as a student of English literature, I know that uh, this is not how they analyze their own literature. But you know, Why is he's, it that he's calling the term political philology. Yes. Philology is a study of text looking for meaning, interpretation of text. But it can be, there's many approaches to philology. So Marxist philology, which he, he's calling the term political philology, is the interpretation of text for a political motive, that looking for political, hidden political motives in this text. You may have written something and you don't think it has anything to do with class trucker, but you know what? We can Freudian psychoanalyze you and say in your basement, in your su subconscious, in your unconscious, lies this hatred or prejudice and it comes out indirectly in, the, in your style of writing and you don't know it, but we are the doctor, we'll tell you that. True. Now, there's two points here. Firstly, I personally think this, uh, prim this position you take on the inside-outsider needs slight amendment. Because all insiders will not view it similarly and all outsiders need not be right. as gross right. as his interpretation Absolutely. is. I mean, take David Shulman, for example. Right. He is as much an outsider right. as is uh, Pollock, right. but David Shulman is not so gross right. so, in the interpretations. Yeah, so I have written this idea in, in one of the early chapters, I have explained the term insider and outsider. And I've said that when you want to have a debate, when you want to highlight things, you need to pick a t term of convenience. And not all insiders are one view. There is a big diversity among the insiders. They also fight and disagree with each other. And not all uh, outsiders are of a certain view. Nor am I saying that all Americans are outsiders. I mean, there are some people who are really deep into bhakti. Uh, there are right. people deep into philosophy or Indian philosophy. They're more into it than Indians are. That's and right. so insider and outsider should not be taken as Indian and American. It's not an ethnic or racial term. A lot of Indians at the left are not insiders. Mm. I mean, they are brown-skinned outsiders. So I'm looking at it more like an ideological stand on these issues, 
uh, whether you think it's political or sacred, mm -hmm. whether you think it's oppressive or liberating, whether mm -hmm. you think it's dead or alive, are the sort of criteria which I'm uh, calling insider and outsider. And any ethnicity can belong to either insider or outsider. And there are people who are both. There are people who are a bit of insider, a bit of outsider. There are people who are privately insiders, but publicly for career sake they become outsiders. That's true. And there are also people the other way around. They are really, really outsiders, they are out to get you, but they pretend to be insiders Insi to get like you. Like Pollock does. Yeah, that is right. Now, now this whole business of politicization, uh, let, let's say, let's accept that there is a certain uh, political worldview in Ramayana, and there is, there is. Right. also in, for example, Mahabharat, right. uh, for example, the theory of kingship. Right. Um, the large parts in Mahabharat as well as in Ramayana, which do describe what are the, uh, what, what an ideal king is about. Right. Now the point that I would like you to uh, respond to is that the popular view within India of theory of kingship either in Ramayana or say in Mahabharat um, is one of extreme accountability to the people right. on whom the king is That's governing. So he's not it's to be not an autocratic he, authoritarian absolutely. king. Yes. It's also not, far from absolutist. Right. And the king, unlike say the European medieval notion of kingship, right. isn't sitting top of the pyramid right. and next only to God who has right. to be obeyed right. unconditionally. On right. the contrary, right. um, the king can be not only disobeyed, but um, uh, challenged yes. in many ways. So I've given a lot of these, uh, these points as counter examples. And the, 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 the main point, one of the big problems... So where does he get this authoritarian, autocratic... See, because the whole like, idea of Ram Rajya, for yeah, example, which yeah. Gandhi popularized even right. through the freedom movement, right. is an ideal place where everybody is fearless, everybody is equal, there is no tyranny, there is no exploitation. Right. The king takes good care of each subject, so much so that even a dhobi, mm. and that dhobi incident, when interpreted through feminist eyes, can mean one thing, mm. but when interpreted through uh, king's accountability to people, right. you know, it is that the humblest citizen mm. has a right to challenge mm. any action of the king right. and expect to be taken seriously. Right. So where does he get this well, notion you know, of authoritarian, So he uses quotes for absolutist instance, he, king. He, he takes arguments, he's written a lot on the Ramayana, he takes arguments out of, out of context and he for instance says that uh, none of the characters in the Ramayana, none of the major characters seem to have creativity, free will, <laughs> they, they are all obedient to fatalism. It's a fatalism. That's ridiculous. But this it's is a, very, a choice this to a obey very, your father. Yeah, but this is a very, How can it be called fatalism? That, right, but it's a very, very standard western interpretation for a long time that this karma equals fatalism. And so one of the things that has happened to Indian society, it is stuck in caste and fatalism. And so to liberate them, you have to come from outside. This is a civilizing mission. So this whole idea that uh, op of oppression has to do with you're oppressed by an, a metaphysics of fatalism, which is because of karma. And you are, and this whole caste, caste and karma together really are the knockout. I mean, you just, you're fatal. But this is, this is so ridiculous. If you look at even Ramai, yes. for example. Yeah. Ram had the choice not to obey. His right. father didn't want him to obey Kekai's dictates. Right. His praja didn't want him to obey right. those dictates. Right. Neither did anybody want Sita to go with Ram. Right. They all kept pleading with her, including Ram himself, right. that you please stay here, life will be very harsh. She chooses to accompany right. Ram right. because there is a certain idea of conjugality right that's being put forward as an idea. Right. Now the point that I, or even Lakshman, right. nobody wanted him to go, where right. is fatalism? It's a choice, but it's a tough choice. Right. It's a choice that, um, uh, that again gives you a tough, but very, very uh, elevating mm. sense of what it is to be a brother, yes. what it is to respect family ties, right. what it is to be a devoted son, mm -hmm what it is to be a, uh, 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 you know, loyal, uh, 
marriage partner, mm. all that. So where is fatalism? So this is where it's the, not as if there's a shrap. Yeah, you have to do it, and right. there's no this choice. This is where this is where the adhikar comes in. If no person who's an insider to the Ramayan tradition had a chance to review their works, peer review their works, if their works are uh, uh, attempted entirely in the outsider space of who could. It's not even them. outside. It's nonsensical, Rajiv. Yes. yes. Not. But I you mean, know the thing is that you, what you have to re look at is that. Uh, Sheldon Pollock has been writing on the Ramayana since the 1980s. I know, I'm aware. Uh, he, he did the critical edition of, the, of one of the volumes and uh, in, the, in the Clay Library he did a lot. He's written many, many articles on Ramayana after that. He, it's a favorite topic of his in TV, TV uh, interviews. I know. Uh, and you know, the, I, one of the things I criticize is the Tehelka interview and the NDTV interviews, all these interviews where they're just eating out of his hand, none of those interviews have the sense, the common sense, the audacity, the curiosity to challenge him on any of these things. Mm -hmm. So he just keeps saying these things and they, they're so impressed. So if you repeat a lie a thousand times, it becomes... Well, I think in his case, he's very aesthetic about the, his demeanor, extremely nice, constantly praising Sanskrit as a beautiful language with a lot of poetry. But of course, when you read his stuff, this beautiful language with a lot of poetry also has a lot of oppressiveness in it and it doesn't have anything legitimate sacred in, in its sacredness. So removing the sacred and replacing it with oppressiveness and political motive, once you've done that, you can keep saying it's a beautiful language. But it, as a language, it's beautiful and some of that poetry is very nice, but, and that impresses people a lot. But they need to have done this book. The, in our people need to have written this book decades ago. I agree, but uh, when you say that uh, by removing the sacred, I, that the mischief comes from removing the sacred. I say that for a minute. That, that, no. that vacuum created. No, I, I, I would go a step further. Let's say even if I am reading it as an atheist, right. okay, the Ramayana itself, um, an atheist can still have uh, high standards mm. of loyalty to family, Mm -hmm. uh, or responsibilities of the king mm -hmm. to the subject. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things in and drama. And for it for human rights violations. No, no I'm saying to, what he calls human rights violations um, are in fact, are, take even say Agni Pariksha of right. Sita. Right. If you have studied literature, it's well known technique that when you when a writer wishes to evoke horror at the injustice of something. It's like Othello, uh, you know, um, when uh, Shylock demands pound of flesh right. from of Othello. Mer sorry, yeah, Mer Merchant of Venice. Uh, the idea is not that Shakespeare is saying it's the right thing to do. Correct. It's to evoke a sense of horror, Correct. Right? right? Or when uh, Othello murders Desdemona. Right. The idea is not to say husbands have a right to murder. I mean, we accept, it's broadly accepted that it's to evoke a sense of rejection and horror at the unreasonableness of the act. So I think it's the same dramatic technique, say, for with Agni Pariksha. How could, and, and people in this subcontinent have interpreted it like that? How dare Ram ask such a... But see, Pati Vrata wife but see as that, a, but for Agni Pariksha. He might say, I don't know whether he would, he might say that in Merchant of Venice, while Shylock is entitled to the pound of flesh, but Portia, if I remember correctly, comes as a, dressed as a man, as a lawyer who's going to uh, prosecute or, or to defend the other fellow, right? And turns this thing around and, cap and corners Shylock that, you know, you can take this pound of flesh, but yeah. you will take a drop of blood. Yeah. So the, the story then does nail him. So, if, so the idea is... But so, so does Ram get nailed yeah. all the time with, for example, in many <coughs> Ramayanas, his mother stops talking to him. She says, how dare you do this to me? Lakshman protests, even Hanuman, right. are the prime so, devotee. So, so now let me and there are so many Ramayanas sure. where Ram is made to behave differently so because that's yeah. not acceptable. No, that's very true. 
So now let me ask you a question. Why do you think that if for 30, 35 years a certain view of Ramayan has been perpetrated this way? It has been allowed to get into the U.S. school systems. There are so many movies on Ra Ram as a bad guy has been coming out, including in India. All this has come to now to this CRK Ram or something like that TV series based on similar philosoph philosophical, similar interpretations as Pollock's. So Pollock from the uh, academic has gone down to pop culture. These ideas have spread everywhere. Why is it that nobody in India has bothered to, I mean, this really troubles me. Why is it that nobody in India bothered to respond? And the answers I get, and I want your view on it, the answers I get are things like, why should we care? Truth is in my heart. Hamko kya parva? It's a kind of a benign neglect. Maybe it's laziness. Some of them would say, we don't read enough English. We can't understand what the heck these guys are saying. That's also uh, an issue. And some of them are very bombastic in their rejection. And they're not rejecting thoughtfully. They are, they are not arguing logically. I'm trying my best to do that. They get so angry and emotional that they, they don't matter. So why, why do you think that uh, Ramayan is a very interesting point. You've, we agree on this completely ridiculous interpretation, very one-sided. But it has been allowed to spread so much. And there has been no rebuttal from our side. Okay, let me tell you. Firstly, I personally have done some you rebuttals. Done okay, yes, you have done that. with regard to Sita, with regard to why other ones. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you okay. why. I should know. You should tell because me. I am in the belly of the monster. Yes. Okay. Okay. Firstly, if you challenge, I remember when this book, The Many Ramayanas, mm -hmm. was being published, right. and one of my articles was included, and I had taken. Uh, I had critiqued, uh, who's that UCLA person? Uh, uh, rich, uh, rich Gold, uh, rich Goldman. Goldman. Uh, the wife. Yeah, 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 the, uh, Paula. Paula Goldman, yeah. that's right. right. Now, in this conference in Sita, Paula Goldman came up with one kind of interpretation. This right. was a conference on Sita at, right. in, uh, in, was it Oxford or Suez? And mine was a con counter, counter to her. And my essay, when it had to be edited by Paula Richman, she just forced me to cut out my critique of her. She no, says, no, you state your is, position. This is One second. I've seen so many times. Yes. Not only that. Yes. No. Secondly, the, as I went in the direction of challenging the standard feminist, leftist, Marxist, postmodernist, and modernist wisdom, all it meant is you were completely sidelined, you know. I used to be otherwise quite a favorite uh, uh, person for lectures in American universities. Once they realized I was not singing the songs they wanted to hear or they wanted their students to hear, then those invitations stopped. Uh, not only will you not be invited to conferences, you won't be able to get published anywhere. I mean, you had difficulty with this book. Yes. When I wrote my book on Modi, I couldn't get a publisher. I had to publish it myself. And again, there was, you know, time constraint. I couldn't get a place to release it. Uh, even India International Center canceled the booking. Really? Yes. Gandhi Peace Foundation canceled the booking for the release of my book. So Gandhi is, Peace Foundation. Yeah. So the point is that you will be so sidelined, you will cease to exist. You will never get a promotion, you'll never get a decent job, you will ne never get a fellowship, you will never be invited to a conference, and you'll be treated like an untouchable in the way that I am, even at CSDS. So, so how many people are going to risk so it? So we agree on this one point that there is an invisible glass ceiling that the traditional No, no, it's very visible. But the traditional <laughs> guy somehow says, I am not going to do I don't but traditionals to... are not reading it, nah. Yeah, See, is... the point is that they are in their own world. Right. The believers are in their own world. They are saying, what are No, no, they don't even know what's being written about them. Yeah. It's like, say for example, BJP. You right. say, if you read Economic and Political Weekly or any of their journals, you only see filthy abusers. Right. You know, fascist, mass murderers, whatever. And the dirtiest of political abuses are hur hurled at them. The fact is, you'll know. never find a counter simply because these people never read those. Right. Their universe, They're intellectual un like universe is different. Totally. Like They'll never invite uh, right. somebody from the contrary viewpoint right. in conferences. Like there was this, uh, you know, network created by somebody in Manchester University for study of Hinduism. 
So, I was included in that and we had series of conferences and it's very interesting. I said, oh my God, somebody really wants to study Hinduism, uh, not just and wants me in it. That means they must want to do something decent and sensible, not just demonize it. So, I joined with great enthusiasm till I found that all they had was the same Christopher Jeffalot, Tanika Sarkar, Hinduism or Hindu right, Hindutva is equal to fascism. The only thing that you had coming by way of papers one after another was these kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, atrocity, uh, atrocity, literature. Yeah, atrocity literature. So when my turn came to organize one of those meetings, I said, look, what I'm going to do, I insist on is that we have the practitioners. You want to criticize the RSS by all means, but have an RSS right. guy listen to you and respond. You want to criticize X, Y, Z, whatever, you know, or say whatever about it. You had to have those people. So I organized that kind of a thing. They were extremely uneasy about it. They couldn't take it mm -hmm. because not only when they demonize you, in one case, this American scholar had done a study of a Martin Karnatak. Mm -hmm. So she presents a paper, but the head of that mutt was also present and he's very learned. Uh, he spoke better English than this uh, uh, American scholar and he tore the paper in a very sophisticated way to shreds mm. by pointing simply to factual errors, mm. just odd, simple blatant factual mm. errors. Now that's the kind of challenge that they are not willing mm. to do. Uh, take and very on. few of our people are actually willing to give that or able to give that. Like this space person. in a year. Yeah. There's no space. Yeah. See, they don't allow that space to be created. So let me tell you uh, one more point. Since, since we are on to discussing the role of the anti-Hindu, the Hindu phobic or the left or whatever, Pollock is a very special person to them because he knows Sanskrit very well, which Ramila Thapar didn't know, Irfan Habib didn't know, these kind of people didn't know. And so he's very special in this and he's, he's filling the, this gap of the Indian left and he's trained all kind of Westerners and Indians mm. to sort of do this political philology. Mm. So this new approach to Sanskrit studies, mm. uh, you will notice some people in your CSDS also have come oh, back yes, as students. Oh yes, my God. Now they can, now they can uh, quote some Shastra to make their point. So now it is Marxism armed with some Sanskrit stuff they can quote. This has become very dangerous. Not only that, let me tell you, very recently some of my colleagues who have taken on this challenge, you know, because as you mentioned yesterday in your lecture, that earlier these leftists, when they said something, people said, but you haven't read, uh, how can you say you can't read Sanskrit, you can't read Marathi, you can't read any of the languages. So they've started actually taking the reading of these texts seriously. Right. So some of my colleagues, set up a reading circle, a reading group for these texts. You know, they had a Mahabharat study group and then the second one was Manusmriti, mm -hmm. Manusmriti study group. Right. But again, the person they invited or the person they, three American scholars came to train mm -hmm. them in reading or interpreting Manusmriti and I asked them, so what has why not a Pandit from right. Varanasi? Exactly, so what has happened is, in one stage, the Americans have taken over the interpretation and the further stages, they are now the producers of knowledge, Indians are the consumers, they are now coaching the next generation of Indians who will then go through society uh, trying to expunge so-called violence in the text. You know, so he wants to decontaminate the texts. He mm. clearly writes that he wants to make it safe, remove the toxicity. These are words used in Pollock's writings that, that what he calls liberation philology. And Political philology is looking for the politics. Liberation philology is now liberating the people from that toxicity by getting rid of all those things which are bad and dangerous according to their point of view. So giving, giving Hindus our human rights. So now they're <laughs> going to give our Hindus rights. So in a sense, one person made a very insightful remark on, on what I'm doing. He said, you know, what you are doing is you're uncovering that they want to write the new Smithies. They want to write new Smithies, they're training Smithy writers who will make it look like hey, these are Hindu Smithies, but they will become exceedingly left-wing Marxist new Smithies. 
So this will be the Charvak 2.0 in the sense that it's very, it's very uh, extremely atheistic. Nothing wrong. No, with it's that not right atheistic. Side. I'm sorry. I don't agree with you there because the impetus is coming from the else. evangelicals. Yes. From those who are very angry with India right. for not having succumbed wholesale right. to conversions right. to Christianity. Right. I think uh, the end game will not be conversion to Judaism. And the end game is not going no, to No, no, Judaism is not yeah. even on the table. Right. Uh, not, and, and the end game will not be a conversion to some kind of a communist state because communism is on the way out. It's just an intermediate step to get rid of the Hindu context, to get rid of the Hindu you know, institutions and the meanings of these texts that have to uh, in people's lives so that it becomes an easier thing to Christianize. See, when you said uh, the agenda is not even communism, at, in fact, not at all. Right. But it's very noteworthy that Western universities, especially now the Americans, will patronize only leftist scholars mm. uh, for whichever discipline. Right. Um, except maybe economics, mm. where people like Arvind Panagreya may... That's because the multinationals exactly, are free markets. Exactly. Other than that, history, sociology, political science. The social sciences are all. Social right. sciences are all uh, are the preferred. Uh, so one thing I want to ask you is, since you are India based, you know this place better than me. Why has the new? I mean, why has the new government? They ought to be smart and do do all this. Is it that the uh, people on our wavelength don't exist in large enough numbers? Is it the government is scared? What exactly has kept us two years? into this government, two years and we haven't replaced some of the senior people who are from the old left guard. Before I answer that okay. question, I, will, I had another point that I, okay. you know, what I noticed and it's linked to what you've been saying earlier, which is that they pre most of these people present themselves as liberals, okay? Right. Um, and their critique of Hindu groups is that that's illiberal, that's uh, obscurantism, etc. We are the liberals, right. and we uh, we relate to the liberal strand within Hindu tradition, right. and there they find bhakti movement or whatever as their big peg to hang right. things. But here, the most illiberal thing that I find about Pollock's mm -hmm. way of presenting things is that not only does he want to be taken seriously, but what he's saying is, I and people like me alone have the monopoly of interpretation. Well, he, yeah. Anybody else within the tradition especially who does so is doing it for bad purposes. For example, Sanskrit Bharti, right. very disdainful towards the attempts of Sanskrit Bharti. And, and any attempt by BJP, these kind of people, exactly. uh, sort of like it is, they're, they're killing Muslims, they've done this, yeah. so they're tainted people, and whatever they're doing is to be really hit hard because they're tainted yeah. people and they're bad. bad they're tainted bad. people because they're Hindu, right. basically. Right. Even the Ramanan Sagar uh, uh, Ramayana right. uh, on the television serial, uh, the whole theory is that it was done for bad, with bad ends in view. They wanted to get BJP in power. They or, the and promote obscurantism and women's oppression and training women to accept a subsidy. Right, right. I mean, that's the whole. So let's say whatever the uh, aims and ends be. But the fact that nobody within the tradition should even have the right to own these texts, do with them what we like, who the hell, why do we need your permission right. or certification? But you know, that liberalism also is lacking. But I would say I also blame the traditional people for not sticking their neck out because if I, without the training that most of these people have in Sanskrit and so on, sitting far away, am able to do this, stick my neck out, then there should have been people in, uh, we have 15 Sanskrit universities in this country, they have vice chancellors, they have funding, they have resources, we have so many mathas. Now, the, one of the biggest mathas is about to sell out to them, this whole Shingeri thing, because they are in awe that these guys are better than us and we will be in good hands because they look after us and New York Jayangi Aji Amko, we'll look after and we'll get VIP treatment. All that kind of stuff go, is also part of it. Some of the best Sanskrit scholars I discovered in, the pro in this process, when I sent my re book to review, my manuscript to review, 
because I was criti criticizing certain people that have given them patronage, they did not want to touch it. They said, okay, we do not want to be involved in this. So they would give me things privately, but don't quote me. This sort oh of thing. my God. Yeah. So our people are also a little bit sold out, a little bit fearful. Little bit, no. Huh. Hugely. 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 We are only too willing to be. But now soldiers. we have money, so why aren't the billion? Why are the billionaires spending, putting money into chairs in their hands when that same money could be used to upgrade our standard of education? But here? you see, the, the alternative viewpoint is not available in the English language. Right. See, the the other thing is that having uh, made English as the main vehicle of right. scholarship in India, right. whether there is not a single history journal in any Indian language, right. there's not a single Marathi journal in any Indian language. Uh, it's all, it has to be all in English. Right. Now if uh, Rohan Murthy, who gave this right. money, right. has to access or express his uh, admiration or commitment to this heritage, right. who does he go to? Mm. They are the only ones writing. And if you write any other which way, you won't get published. Right. So you completely uh, so we become so it's like almost like totally a monopoly no return for us it's a monopoly and this monopoly needed to be broken and that brings me to the point you raised why has this government done zilch and you know to challenge this monopoly not only that but i have had zero support in this i have gone to 23 events hmm. And I worked hard, and I have health issues, and I have no support. I mean, but my volunteers are coming up with money, the students to rent halls, and I mean, I really moved at the level of support, uh, without counting on any institution of power we have right now to do even one thing for me. And so I am doing it in spite of all that for my passion, and I don't understand why. Why are they are they threatened? They shouldn't be threatened ideologically because I'm actually helping doing their job, which they should have done. Are they scared that maybe this guy, you know, he'll become in the limelight? My feeling is that the guys at the very top probably don't know this. Um, and the people who are sort of a little bit below them would rather get, get into things which they can claim credit for. They can look like they're very smart. So uh, I'm an outsider. I'm not a member of any of these organizations, never have been. So I'm, I'm just somebody that can be ignored on the side and they can sort of pick my brain and, uh, you know, without mentioning names, one of the major political parties invited me to lunch a couple of days ago with their 10 or 12 uh, spokespersons sitting around and each of them wanting to get tutored okay, achha, humko ye prashin pucha jata hai, what is your vichar, kya kehna chahiye and I said I'm not here to tutor you are a private coach and all that I've come here to ask you you large part of your people come and learn from me they attend my events they buy my books and I'm very helpful to them and they're very grateful to me but you as the leaders what have you done for me and they were just dumbfounded that I could talk to them. Like See, that. it's not doing for you or for X, Y, Z. I but mean, for I, themselves even. I'm saying for India. Yes. Forget themselves. Because they came with the agenda that they were going to transform the face of India. Right. And that would include not just economic regeneration, but also from the kind of impression Modi gave right. that this deracinated education system this monopoly of the left, the intellectual monopoly um, uh, that in the manner in which they've used, this needs to be challenged. But if you look at the past 18 months or more now, no, 20 almost months now. Almost two years now. Yeah. yeah, almost two years now, 20 months. All the major institutions of social science research continue to be, like, continue to be ruled yes. by the same people. Right. ICSSR, same t team is in place. CSDS. CSDS, though, you know, there the government can't change because faculty is permanent. So CSDS is different. ICSSR, the board and the top appointees who decide the agenda but where does have CSDS to be changed. CSDS gets money from ICSSR? From the ICSSR okay, through so HRD ministry. But I mean, can, HRD they can, ministry they through ICSSR. put ICSS. some financial uh, uh, burdens on CSD. I'm want. saying forget that. It's a very hai. For Nehru Memorial uh, uh, Research Center, headless. Um, they removed the old guy, but haven't found time to appoint a new one. ICHR, they did so, but such a high-handed job. And somebody not really together, right. so that 
you know, things aren't really moving, and then they forced him to resign, and then created such a shindig over it. So nowhere, FTII, you saw, they put a guy who became a joke, mm. because he's so unfit for the job. So when they appoint... They I see, I see uh, uh, Indian Council... I historical see, Research. No, no, the... I ICCR. ICCR recently gave an award in Rashtrapati Bhavan to one of those guys, I've written in Indra's net, uh, that he's one of the founding fathers, the main uh, scholars of this whole neo-Hinduism thesis that gave him an award in, in uh, Rashtrapati Bhavan. Uh, so I couldn't understand. I mean, don't they have a think tank or somebody to vet these names to do some background checks? They don't that? do any reading and they couldn't care less. They shun people like you who could uh, force them to act. But I'm not looking for, I'm not even competing with these people for a position. It's not that you're competing. Many of when us... They, when they did this, uh, this uh, conclave in Goa, I was excluded. Two, three years in a row. You know, the, Why? I have no idea. I wrote to Ram Madhav. He knows me. He stayed in my house in Princeton. We, we know each other. Uh, until he got into power, he was fine with me. Uh, I written every time I, I'm in visiting that I'm coming from this day to that day. If there are any important events, anything I should attend, let me know. I'd like to call you. I'd like to talk to you. But it is silence. There is just no response. And I'm never invited. So I don't know what is the thing going on. Is it jealousy? Is it fear? Or am I tainted so much that they now want to impress other people? You see? I don't think even it's even that. Because political software is right. created by these ministries. Right. And Congress Party used them very well right. by sucking in leftists right. and making them its intellectual foot right. soldiers, right. and therefore came to acquire monopoly. I mean, right. uh, the decline of Congress is also on account of this because they actually completely trampled over, sidelined their own intellectual tradition. Right. Congress had a very rich intellectual right. tradition. Right. Right. The nationalist historians, for example, right. R.C. Majumdar. Yeah totally eliminated mm. and supplanted by leftist historians. Right, right. And this, the left did for the Congress and the Congress um, let it happen mm. um, not only willingly, but it's as though the left was doing them a favor mm. by erasing the nationalist um, intellectual tradition right. in history and social sciences. Mm -hmm. and, and they seem to be proud of it. Either they don't read or uh, God knows what the method behind that madness is. So what the left uh, for the Congress did to its own intellectual tradition, the BJP is doing it uh, more ham-handedly mm. by not even bringing in anybody. It's a vacuum. Mm. They seem to have no agenda. So when, they, when you say that they don't invite you to do this or they don't use your brains without, you don't even need any returns, it's because there's no agenda. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I see certain people very intellectually ambitious in their camp who want to be seen surrounded by intellectuals. Uh, they, they want to create this conclave and sponsor this and talk about that and quote this and that sounds or overnight like they become very learned. And they seem to be very selective in bringing certain people and excluding certain people. And I honestly don't know what the game is. I think it's a lot of personal uh, friction with somebody. They don't like someone. Uh, it's petty stuff. It, and for a major party ruling a major country, it, it doesn't behoove well that some people have this pettiness about it. But you know, with you, there can't be, there should not be any clash of interest simply because you're not asking for anything. Yeah. You don't want to be a minister. Right, you don't right, want to right. be head of this or that right. uh, institution. Right. That's not your game. Right. But they could certainly use your services and create a team right. of people like you right. who did a thorough review of social science research right. I, I, in I the last train, six I decades. Be, what I would, the pet project I would love to do is to, if they gave me a hundred bright young people and said, now you train them. You run an institute, you run, uh, give them some, a uh, few semesters of education on how to be a writer, how to be a thinker, what are the major issues. Or even review social science research. Right. Like you reviewed Pollock. Right. I think the entire domain of social science research needs to be reviewed. Yes. What kind of priorities have come to right, be? Right. Um, what kind of divisive agendas are coming through social science right. research right. 
um, combined with, of course, certain kind of NGO activism. Right. You know, right. Uh, that needs to be done yes. urgently, and it doesn't seem to and be. And just these things take time the, to bear fruit. You cannot just order it and have it done. I think they don't probably understand how much effort, time, brains it takes to produce results because to do these reviews takes a lot of effort. Absolutely. I mean, this thing sucked my whole pran for one and a half years. So uh, they might think ke ho jayega kabhi ag baad mein dekhing, but they don't understand that we're losing time and uh, before the term is over you won't be able to complete many projects even if you started them now. Now finally to conclude, why do you think they haven't, Pollock and company, haven't responded? The newspapers are not reviewing your book? I think they will. I think there is a huge attack coming. I, I'm expecting that I don't know what kind of attack it will be. I hope it's intellectual. I hope it's serious uh, scholarly level and it's a chance to not some sort of hit me in a newspaper where I'm not allowed to respond, but something more open where we can give and take. I'm more than happy to be corrected. I'm more than happy to say, okay, let's, this was not right and I'll accommodate that. I have no problem making adjustments, but I do want a voice and I want a voice for our tradition. That's what I want. I'm opening the doors for our traditional voice. It is not that mine is the final word. I don't want But to they didn't it. review you. They didn't engage with you in Correct. your previous book also. Never. They only this is my fifth put book. And they've bogus never, charges. They've never reviewed me at all. And they uh, only uh, mentioned me to attack me, which is very strange. One of my points I wrote to mention to Ravi of the Hindu is that how come the Hindu never reviewed me and I'm a stranger to their readers and the first time they ever hear of me is that I've suddenly become so important <laughs> that a full huge article on the front page is about me, uh, bad things. But who is this Rajiv Malhotra? Nobody mentioned who is this fellow and why is he so, why does he matter? So he was also dumbfounded. He said that is true. And so there is a, it's a very shallow and kind of a mean, sh meanness, it's fear. I think that- But now you know. See, if you were a young scholar, okay, then I would, would be you be scared. able to survive? I would be very scared. No, you couldn't. You couldn't have found a publisher. And I would be, I would be uh, uh, not able to, uh, uh, I would be scared of my career. I would not have the credibility. But you see, this is hard earned. This is very hard earned because I'd done first book with Rupa, second book with Amaryllis, and I kept showing that I sell well in spite of what they do. I don't, in fact, they were very surprised when I said I don't, I don't even need any mainstream coverage because I'll go and do 23 events and the least will be 250 attendees, the maximum we got was 1500 in IIT Bombay. Full packed audiences, large percentage of them buying these books, standing in very long lines to get them signed, lots of uh, good video footage. So I have created a kind of my own with the help of social media, my own marketplace. And I can guarantee them that the moment I write a book, there'll be X thousand sold right away. Mm -hmm. So I think that has gotten them thinking, the, the publishing industry thinking that, you know, he is publishable. He's an important... No, you are publishable, but within the academic circles, they will still not prescribe this That book. is correct. They, they will, will still not mention it even as a footnote. That is correct. They will ignore so it because... they will ignore because it. it. Because it's very dangerous for them. I know. So then... How do you make a breakthrough there? So my breakthrough is so keep surrounding them. And the fact is that I've been invited by at least seven or eight different academic institutions this time. So I, when I go, there's full of young people. So that's w how I'm getting in. So social media pressure will force them at some point. Students are bringing me in. Faculty brought me into Delhi University Sanskrit department and I really See, care. Sanskrit department but is not about, their domain. Yes, yes, but the thing is, once but history Sanskrit department will not true. get you. Yes, but the Sanskrit departments, both JNU and Delhi University, once since they are on board and since they are going to start writing, some people are going to do their PhD on Pollock. One guy came to me and said his, his whole PhD is on Pollock and he's going to take this book as a starting point and go deeper and analyze it, which is great. I like more PhDs coming that way. Once that begins to happen and these people feel a little more empowered, the chair of, of Sanskrit department, Delhi University, said that I challenge the history department to come and debate us. He said it right in the mid middle. They won't. Yeah. So we are empowering our side. We are giving them more ammunition, more you know, things to work with, and, and giving them some weapons to go and fight the other side. That's what I'm trying to do with this. I'm not debating the history side because they don't want to. So I'm saying, OK, I'll, I'll empower and educate my team, and they'll fight you. 
So as time goes by, they will feel the pressure. Uh, you will feel that people in English study, English honors and history and political science and all these kind of people will feel pressure from more and more young people who are being trained in a different way. See, young people have to reach a certain position of power before they can. Now let me give you a very recent instance of how they can shut you out and destroy you. I was nominated by one of my senior colleagues of the previous generation, Biru Bajret, for national professorship of the ICSSR. And without my having asked for it, it did come to me. I've been selected as national professor. It's supposed to be a great quote-unquote honor mm -hmm. for any institution to have one of its faculty accepted or offered this because it's supposed to be on the basis of your preeminent scholarship or whatever. It's not something that you apply for, but you are awarded. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the requirements of this scholarship is that an institution, preferably my home institution, has to give me affiliation. Mm -hmm. Do you know that the CSDS has denied me affiliation? It's mm -hmm. never happened Very in the history of ICSSR. Counterproductive for their own interest. Not only has it never happened in the history of ICSSR, it has never happened in the history of CSDS that anybody with a funded fellowship, uh, even when it's a uh, refraff uh, scholar, you know, from nowhere on earth, nobody has ever been denied. Uh, affiliation. Mm. I'm the one and only instance. Mm. And there are 10 other examples. I'm the only one in this rotational system who's never been made director of CSD. So I'm the senior most. I can give you a whole list of things that they've done to me. I never protested mm. all these years. But what they've done now, you know, I accepted marginalization after the old generation Dhirubhai and others retired because they, they certainly behaved with far greater grace. They invited me to join CSDS. But this has never been done, which is you've got a prestigious fellowship and they will not give you affiliation. So it's a mafia. It's a mafia. Yeah. Yes. So the uh, question I have is, besides the old timers who are there from the Indira Gandhi days and so on, what has allowed them to recruit young people over and over again, even now? They seem to be getting young people. Because if you follow that path, you get jobs, you get fellowships, you get uh, invitations to conferences abroad. The moment you fall out of line, you disappear. Nothing will come your way. Mm. Simple. This monopoly, this vicious monopoly mm. that the left has over prime jobs, mm and fellowships and all these intellectual centers. Right. That's what does it. Right. And this monopoly needed to be challenged. Mm. These institutions needed to be um, opened up, right. actually liberalized, right, right. In not have just one. Uh, right. It's it's very Stalinist way of doing things. Yeah, yeah. Just as in West Bengal, during CPM rule, you couldn't get even a peon's job, leave alone a professor's job if you weren't a card-holding party member. All jobs were shut out. So in a sense, the new government is continuing to fund and patronize and nurture their yes, enemies. Yes, absolutely. That's what you're saying. Who hate them, or who give them hard time. And but yet tell me if they were to take hard step and say, okay, these two, three hundred people we're going to remove, do they have replacement people? That's the issue. See, for, for the next 25, 30 years, right. The government of India should create a very large social science uh, research fund and say we will not allow foreign funded research in mm. India. Even if foreign scholars want to research India, they'll come with our China money. China has that. Huh, I know. Well, China does it in a very, very authoritarian manner. Right. We could be... But they get away with it. They People get respect them. Of course. People respect them. Of course. See, I, I'm not in favor of academic authoritarianism, but I'm certainly, firstly, need very serious need to review social science research. 
what's the narrative they've built around Indian society? What are its political invasions? Just as one Aryan invasion theory right. has actually caused Democrat, havoc yes, political, yes, yes. the divide between Dalits, non-Dalits, uh, north, south. north, south, that's right, Aryan, Dravidians, all these imaginary divides too that they've been able to create. Or the Hindu-Muslim discourse, whereby the victims are to blame. Mm. Kashmiri Pandits are to be blamed right. for the fact that they left Kashmir, not those who pushed push them, them push out. Them out. Right. Uh, so this entire discourse has been created with generous help from international donor agencies, Ford the Ford Foundation, and the HEVOS, yes. the, the entire. So I would just ask them to pack up, leave. Right. But then you need the Narayan Murthys of the world rather than funding those guys to cough up some money and create the Indian version of those people. We need the Indian equivalent of the Ford Foundations and by now these guys should have put their heads together and produced something. So anyway, Rajiv, pleasure talking to you. Good to talk to and you. And I hope good sense prevails because essentially this is... Write a review for my book. I certainly will and there are other ways in which uh, we can make we, it happen. We can have some discussions where we can invite opponents yes. but keep it civilized and if you have a, if you host an event where somebody else wants to discuss this with me, I'd love to win my next trip do that. We'll do that. Manushi can do that. Yes, gladly. I would love to see Manushi organize one of these. Yes, I'll, I'll try to yeah. rope in some of the people who otherwise uh, wouldn't want to sit under the same roof with you. Right, right. Try to. <laughs> you say, come, critique it, read the book and... And let's have a conversation. Let's have just, a conversation. We can sit here and talk about it. We don't All the best and Thank keep going. Thank you very going. much. Thank you.